Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jordan and Drew, the sports crew, a bonus episode, that's right, Jordan Lorenz here, back on solo duty for my UFC 262 recap, my world famous recaps, they're back, they're here, but next month there's not going to be one for UFC 263, we'll talk all about it when we get there, but let's start with the prelims, right? of UFC 262. This was a huge card at Houston, Texas, and the Toyota Center, I believe, is where it was. Yes, Toyota Center was the location. Lightweight champion, going to be crowned for the first time. Obviously, Habib Magomedov, and we know all about that story with what happened with him and vacating the title, and did he retire, didn't he retire? He did retire. He's done, so we finally have a new lightweight king, but first, we just got to mention the prelims. Jacare Souza arm his, his arm snapped in half. If you were watching on ESPN, you could hear the sound of it after. It was kind of like, why did he tap? Like, what, what happened here? And then you watch the replay a few times and you hear the sound. Oh, absolutely brutal. And it was just, what, week, two weeks ago, whenever Chris Weidman had the exact same injury happen. Might have been three weeks ago at this point. I don't even remember with his leg, where his leg snapped in half again. And this time... It was an arm snapping, and you could you could just see it. And it's I mean, if you don't like looking at that kind of thing or hearing those things, don't watch. That was a absolutely brutal injury to Jacare Souza and his career, certainly winding down at this point. So it's going to be interesting to see what the future holds for Jacare. Hopefully, he can come back, get at least a win or two before his career ends. But I don't know, man. That was very very rough to say the least. So let's get into the main card. The pay-per-view opened up with a featherweight banger. Edson Barbosa, Shane Burgos, those two we knew, had fight of the night potential in them. And if it wasn't for the wild two-round main event, this probably would have got fight of the night. Edson Barbosa gets the win a minute, 16 seconds into the third round by knockout. This thing was crazy. Barbosa started the fight. He looked well. I mean, this was his only his second fight at featherweight. The last, or his third fight, pardon me. He fought twice in featherweight last year. This was his third, second win in a row at featherweight for Edson Barbosa after that loss to Dan 50K Ige one year ago today, actually. That was on May 16th, 2020. So how about that? Shane Burgos, 13-3 and now. Overall, he looked very good in this fight. Barboza was picking apart the leg of Burgos and it actually actually split the shin of Barboza. You could see the blood from Barboza just dripping down his leg and that was from his own leg kicks. He was kicking Burgos that much and that hard that his own leg got busted open and Barboza's eye started to swell towards the end of the first round. Burgos was doing good things, but Barboza was looking great. He's 22 and 9 overall now and <laughs> the way this fight ended Barboza hit a nice strike and a good little combo, and then 10 seconds later, Burgos' body just gave out on him. He just went down. He was still walking backwards, you know, defending, doing everything right, and then all of a sudden, the man just falls backwards into the fence. Barboza gets a strike or two in. Referee says, we are done. It was wild. I had never seen anything like that finish. What a knockout for Edson Barbosa as he gets the win, and like I said, He's won two of his past three now at featherweight. The weight cut certainly a big factor. I mean, you're going from 155 down to 145, and it's not like this man's walking around at 150 pounds. So Barbosa, 35 years old, he's going to try and fight, I don't know, maybe twice more this year. Once for sure, you would have to assume. But coming off a big win there, Edson Barbosa. Now we got to move on to the women's fight on the main card, Vivian Arujo took on Caitlin Chukagan, and this was an interesting fight. It was a decision. They went all three rounds, and it was close. And honestly, I think the wrong person won. We'll talk about judges in the next fight because I don't have a whole lot to say about the next fight, but we can talk about judges there. Caitlin Chukagan gets the win. One judge gave it 30-27 for Chukagan, which I don't agree with at all. I actually had it 29-28 Arujo. But I'm not complaining. I mean, I predicted Chukagan to get the win, and she's the number two flyweight for the women. She got the job done 16-4 and four overall. Arujo looked pretty darn good in this fight. She held her own, but that third round was all Chukagan. And Arujo, 13 fights in. She's just got to work on her stamina a bit because commentary mentioned it. After she had that takedown in the second round and, you know, was kind of dominating the fight, she looked gassed. It's like she 
And it's not that she even did a whole lot on the ground. I mean, they were just fighting, you know, it was just normal stuff on the ground. Arujo looked good in the second, but final minute, whatever it was, she looked gassed. And in the third round, Chikagan started to pick her apart, but credit to Arujo, she was still throwing down in that third round. I mean, she was trying everything she could to stay in it. Again, I think she won the first and second rounds, but I guess it came down to that first round, which they gave to Chukagan. So that's a win for Caitlin, who's coming off four fights last year. She started the year losing to Valentina Shevchenko. No shame there. And then she beat Antonia Shevchenko, but lost to Jessica Andrade later in the year. Andrade obviously just lost to Shevchenko a month ago or whatever it was. And then Chukagan beat Cynthia Cavillo late in 2020 now gets the win over Arujo so she's won three of her past four and she's looking good she was number two flyweight will she move up to number one I don't know tough to say at this point see if she gets another fight or two before she gets a Valentina rematch potentially it's all up in the air at this point so then the next fight I said I wanted to talk about judges here Matthew Chanel loses to Rogerio Bontarin in a three-round Bantamweight fight. It went to a decision. Pretty boring fight. The crowd was all over him, too. I mean, there wasn't anything special about this at all, but the judges' scorecards were all over the place the entire night, and even in the main event. I will mention that when we get there. That blew my mind what I saw this morning. Well, two judges, yeah, not one, but two gave to Michael Chandler. So earlier in the card, there was one fight where one judge gave it 30 27 to one guy. And the other gave it 30-27 to another. How can two judges be that far off from one another? It just doesn't make sense at all to me how one judge can say, oh, yep, this guy dominated all three rounds and wins the fight. And the other says the same about the other guy. I don't get it. I really don't get it at all. And maybe it was just the judges in Houston, but I have no idea what was going on with the judges in this card. And like I said, Chukagan won 30-27 on one of the judges' scorecards, and I thought Arugia won two rounds to one, so I don't know what they were looking at, but I don't have a whole lot to say about this Bantamweight fight. Chanel now 15-6, and six, and Bontarin 17-3 and three with no contest, so he missed weight, came in at 146, or 136 pounds, and obviously Bantamweight, 135-pound limit, so it's one of those things where, I mean, you're missing by a pound, not the end of the world. It's not like he missed by 5, 10 pounds, but still, you miss weight, you're going to lose some of your money, and it's just the name of the game. Weight cutting is what it is, and there was that video a while ago that surfaced about, it was only a week ago, I guess, maybe less, of one of the fighters who was trying to get on the scale and just completely dehydrated, didn't know what they were doing. That's tough to watch, and Bonnerine misses by a pound here, so maybe he moves up to 145, but he's short. I mean, it's not like he's the tallest frame in the world, and there's some big 145 pounders, so... Moving from 135 to 145 to 155 as Tony Ferguson gets completely demolished by Benil Dariush. This thing, guys, it wasn't even competitive. Benil Dariush just took every advantage he could. He got Tony Ferguson down in the first round, and that kind of sealed the deal at that point. Then in the second, Tony kind of charged. At, well, no, no, no. I'm wrong here. In the second round, what I noticed right away was Tony was fighting from a real distance. He wasn't getting close to Dariush. You could see he was visibly afraid of a takedown. And then once Dariush pushed him against the cage in the first 30 seconds, Tony just fell down to his butt. He didn't even try to really defend or anything. He had a good sprawl in the third round on a bum ankle. We'll talk about that here with the heel hook. I don't know how Tony Ferguson didn't tap. Daryush after the fight said he heard something snap. So I don't know, you know, if that's a knee thing, an ankle thing, whatever you want to say. It was just a brutal submission, but Tony Ferguson, El Kakui did not tap out and this man is insane. 26 and 6 overall now, but he's lost 3 straight fights and he was the one at one point, I mean, everyone wanted the Ferguson-Habib fight. It got scheduled so many times and never ended up happening. But, I mean, if you look at Tony's last few fights and just what has happened to him on the ground, Habib would have absolutely dominated this man if that's what it would have come to. I mean, it just, I don't for the life of me understand how we had Tony Ferguson dominating so much, so many people. And then these last three fights, he's just been going downhill. He's 37 years old now at this point. You got to wonder when 
When is he giving it up? When? I mean, when is this thing going to come to an end? He lost to Justin Gaethje in the main event for the interim title at UFC 249. He lost to Charles Oliveira, co-main event, UFC 256, and now loses to Benil Dariush. Coming event of UFC 262, Ferguson is not able to win the big fight anymore. But before that, I mean, take a look at this. He beat Donald Cerrone, stopped him at the end of the second round, stopped Anthony Pettis at the end of the second round. I remember that fight very vividly. Pettis was very much so in that fight. Now Pettis is losing in PFL? I mean, blows my mind. Ferguson beat Kevin Lee back at UFC 216. Beat Rafael Dos Anjos, beat Lando Veneta, who we saw in the prelims of this card. Beat Edson Barbosa, Josh Thompson, Taibu at UFC 184. Abel Trujillo, talk about a throwback name. Danny Castillo, Kikuno back at 173. Beat Mike Rio at UFC 166. And then lost to Michael Johnson at UFC on Fox 3 in 2012. Like, this man has beaten everyone. He's beaten a who's who of all of the guys here in the lightweight division, and he's been around for a long time. 2011, his first UFC fight was the tough finale. That's his first official fight when Ferguson won the Ultimate Fighter. Later in that year, beat Yves Edwards 42-22-1. Yves is, I mean, that man was insane. Tony Ferguson beat him by decision in 2011 so we're looking at the downfall of tony ferguson here i picked him mostly just because i wanted to see the man win i mean this is a guy who and like i said he's done it all at this point besides win the actual belt it's going to take a lot for him to get back up 155 is one of the most stacked divisions without a doubt and now you're looking at benil Dariush, a legit contender in this division the dude's only 32 his last loss March 3rd, 2018, to Alexander Hernandez. He beat Tiago Moises, Frank Camacho, Drew Dober, Scott Holtzman, Dracar Closey, and then earlier this year beat Carlos Diego Ferreira, and now beats Tony Ferguson. Benil Dariush is dominant, and he had the perfect game plan to pick apart Tony Ferguson here, and it worked, man. I mean, there's nothing else you can say. Dariush knew what he wanted to do, and he did it. And that's the end of the story. Will this be the end of Tony Ferguson? I don't think so, but it's something to think about at this point. Now our main event. Michael Chandler, Charles Oliveira. This was insane. This was absolutely insane. You start off the fight, Michael Chandler charging at Oliveira, connects, and then all of a sudden it looks like Chandler might have a guillotine win in the first 30, 40 seconds of the fight. Oliveira fights out of it, eventually gets the back of Michael Chandler. Chandler is a legit wrestler. He was a former All-American in college at Iowa, I believe, maybe. I remember him showing a graphic, but I don't recall if it was Iowa or not. It was one of the uh, it, I think it was Iowa, but what do I know? Maybe, well, it says here he's born in Missouri, so possibly Missouri. I don't know. I will try and figure it out here. But the thing here was Chandler gets back to his feet, right? And, okay, it was Missouri. He also competed in collegiate wrestling out of the University of Missouri, where he earned NCAA Division I All-American honors. Okay, it was Missouri, not Iowa. Chandler, at the end of the first round, I mean, there's a minute left in this first round and he tags Oliveira he gets him but instead of letting him back to his feet Chandler goes down with Oliveira and he tries to finish with some ground and pound I think if Chandler would have let Oliveira back up to his feet we might have had a totally different outcome of this fight but we'll never know and you can't live with regrets right you're living you're fighting it's only Chandler's second UFC fight dude's 22 and 6 now overall and boy oh boy Charles Oliveira he was hurt to end that first round, and he comes out of the gate swinging. 19 seconds into round number two, Charles Oliveira stops Michael Chandler. This was wild. The dude runs into the announcers afterwards. I don't remember what he said, but then he goes to talk to Dana White, and then he jumps into the crowd. I mean, Charles Oliveira, tears of joy after he picked up the win. It was, this is what the sport's all about, right? This is what it's all about, seeing a guy who's fought for so long and is now peaking at 40 professional fights. I mean, wow. Nothing left to say more Charles Oliveira. This dude is legit. He beat Tony Ferguson and Kevin Lee last year, two years ago. Beat Nick Lentz, David Tamir, 
Jared Gordon. I mean, we can go way back when he beat Jim Miller, Clay Guida in 2018, along with Christos Giagos. This guy is winning fights, and I believe now it said he has more finishes than Donald Cerrone in UFC history. I believe that's what it said. Don't quote me on that yet, but I am pretty, pretty sure that that said he has the most finishes now in UFC history, which just blows my mind. I mean, Charles Oliveira, De Bronx, is here to stay. He has been looking so good, but hey, you have to give it up to Michael Chandler as well. He basically had this man down for a long time in that first round, and now here we are, right? Here we are. And we're going to see if Chandler can get back to the top. We're going to see how long how long can Charles Oliveira stay at the top. I'm looking right here at the former UFC champs. Habib obviously held the belt for 1,077 days when he won on April 7, 2018. Before that, Jens Palver was the first champ in 2001. Then Sean Shirk, BJ Penn, Frankie Edgar. Ben Henderson, Anthony Pettis, RDA, Eddie Alvarez, Conor McGregor. Then you had interim titles. Ferguson held it when he beat Kevin Lee. Poirier held it when he beat Max Holloway. And then Gaethje held it when he beat Tony Ferguson. A lot of interim champs lately. But finally, 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 here we are. We are here and we are ready for a new lightweight king. Charles de Bronx Oliveira is ready to prove to the world he is legit so i mean we're looking ahead to next week here may 22nd back at the ufc apex cody no love garbrandt one of my favorite 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 fighters takes on rob font also some names you might know on the card carla esparza felicia spencer and there is going to be a great middleweight fight to open this show edmund shabazian against jack hermison 11 and 1 against 21 and 6 but those two are going to go at it to start the show. I can't wait to see Cody No Love back in the octagon. This, like I said, absolutely one of my favorite fighters. Last year, he got, he, he beat Rafael Asuncao on June 6, and now we're waiting to see if he can get back where he once was. He was champ. I mean, but Cody No Love, this is a wild, wild career this man has had. I mean, he's got a pair of losses to TJ Dillashaw. This man beat Dominic Cruz, guys. He beat Cruz. He beat Thomas Almeida. Cody Nolov was a star back in 2017, 2016. You know, you're looking back then. And now, I really hope this man gets back to the top. He's only 29, but he's got so much yet to learn. There's just so many little things it seems like he does wrong. But either way, him, Michael Chandler, Cowboy Cerrone, um, Dustin Poirier, Anthony Pettis, I've got a lot of favorites. Cody No Love ranks high in those favorites. And our next pay-per-view is on June 12th from the G the River Arena in Phoenix, Arizona. A stacked card. I'll be missing it. I'll be gone that night, actually. So this is going to be crazy. I am missing two huge rematches. A uh, great Damian Maya fight and the return of Nate Edwards. Nate was supposed to be back at 262, but the fight got pushed back a month, so... Not the end of the world. Jamal Hill, 7-0 with two no contests. Takes on Paul Craig in a big light heavyweight vote. Bale, remember the name Muhammad against Damian Maya. That is going to be great. Nate Diaz, Leon Edwards. Can't say enough good things about that. And now we get to the rematches. The title fights. Davis and Figueredo defends his belt against Brandon Moreno. The flyweights. At one point, this division seemed like it was on ice. It was going to go away. Moreno and Figueredo had a barn burner, as one John Anik would say. A lot of people, including myself, think Moreno won that first fight, so they went right back to the rematch here. I can't wait, and then the main event, Israel Adesanya back down at middleweight after he lost to John Blahovich back, I don't remember when that was, a few months ago at this point now, and here we are, Israel Adesanya defending his belt, he's 20-1. And he takes on Marvin Vittori. Vittori and Israel Adesanya fought years ago. And here we are with the rematch. Vittori is on a hot streak, ladies and gentlemen. Only lost four fights in his career. And will he stop Israel Adesanya? Will we see a new middleweight champ? I don't know. Only time will tell. Thank you all for listening to this UFC recap. We're right at the 20-minute mark. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then you know the drill. Tomorrow... 
Monday. Depends when you're listening at this point. Jordan and Drew, the Sports Crew, episode 10. This is going to be a huge episode. We're actually recording it later today as I record this, and we have a lot to talk about. It'll be a lengthy but a goodie. I can't wait. Thank you all for listening to this. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jordan Law, J O R D O N L A W underscore P X P. And that's all. Maybe I'll be back for UFC 264. I don't know. We will have to see. Thank you all for listening to Jordan and Drew, the sports crew, the perfect podcast for you.